Good day. I'm John Barnes. I'd like to welcome you, and I've been asked to speak to you about my fascia release. My fascia release is a whole body experience, an evaluation and treatment regime that when coupled with traditional therapy can enhance your results and add to the lasting quality of your results. It turns out that the importance of an entire physiological system, the fascial system, has been virtually ignored in your training. Now, my fascia release is not meant to replace all the important techniques and approaches that you currently utilize, but it represents a very important added dimension. It'll help to reduce pain, reduce spasm, reduce spasticity, and increase range of motion, fluidity of motion, and coupled with traditional physical therapy, it will greatly enhance your effectiveness and the permanency of your results. I kind of stumbled into all this because of my own back problems. I had been an athlete. I had uh, run track, played football, swam. Uh, I was a weightlifter. And in my teens, I had fallen with over 300 pounds and severely injured my back. And it was sort of my attempt, my struggle, basically, to help myself. Unfortunately, traditional physical therapy and ultimately surgery had failed me, and I had to help myself somehow. As I look back after I had been developing various techniques on myself, I had noticed that I was making results where all else had not been able to help me. I started to investigate the fascial system because I felt that that was the area that I must be basically stimulating at the time. I think that various forms of myofascial release have been around since the very beginnings of mankind. Under the guise of connective tissue massage, which has been around for centuries, and I think as I've researched this that I've found that the older forms of myofascial release, well-intentioned, unfortunately were too focused on symptoms. They were not addressing the entire fascial system. They were not basically influencing all components of the fascial system. So that as I would work on myself, what I would find is that if something had worked with me, I would modify it, I would refine it, and I'd eventually try it with patients. Those that techniques that didn't work, I'd eventually discard. Over time, I've been able to discover a number of principles that, when applied to the fascial system, will work far better than the old forms of myofascial release, soft tissue mobilization, or connective tissue massage, whichever label you choose to place upon it. Now, I don't only use myofascial release. Uh, I use all forms of therapy that help and do no harm. So in our therapeutic programs, uh, we will incorporate various modalities, uh, manipulation, muscle energy techniques, joint mobilization, facilitation techniques, Feldenkrais, all the other wonderful movement awareness techniques that are so valuable to return people to a pain-free state of existence and allow them to be more fully functional. Now what I'd like to do is go over some of the theory of myofascial release with you. Over the years, what we've attempted to do is try to come up with the best model, the more intelligent model that we can that's based on our experience. It may change from day to day. It may change from year to year. The bottom line is what's really important is that myofascial release, when performed properly, will provide consistent results without trauma. Uh, basically, the fascial system is a tough connective sheath, or sheaths, I should say running from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head without interruption, surrounding, supporting, and protecting absolutely every system, every structure, and every cell of your body. It's the fascia that creates your interstitial spaces. Fascia is predominantly vertically oriented from head to foot without interruption, with very important transverse planes at each joint, the pelvic floor, respiratory diaphragm, thoracic inlet, and the cranial base. These are areas of major dysfunction in the human body, and yet these are areas that have been virtually ignored in the human body. We were taught a number of myths that I'd like to go over with you, and I'd like you to keep an open mind because there's always the possibility of the new. One of the myths that we were taught is the anatomy. We were basically taught the anatomy of dead people without a fascial system. So we've had a very erroneous view of the way the human body truly moves, the way the human body truly functions. The fascia system has an elastic component. It has a collagenous component or plastic component. 
And then very importantly, embedded within this three-dimensional web of fascia lies a matrix or a ground substance, which under normal conditions is a gelatinous-like consistency. Fascia has the propensity from trauma, inflammatory processes, and poor postures over time to tend to solidify, to shorten. It seems like it tightens over time like a spider web or octopus tentacle growing through our body. It can produce enormous tensile strengths on pain-sensitive structures, producing pain, so many of the symptoms that so many of us and our patients suffer with, and restricting proper motion. The important thing here to realize is that fascial restrictions do not show up in any of the standard testing that is now being done. So that most fascial restrictions, even though they are very predominant, are complete, completely missed in all of our evaluatory procedures. Now the nice thing is that we do not need multi-million dollar machines to be able to assess where fascia restrictions lie. You have all that you need as a health professional. You have your hands, your mind, your heart, and with the development of your proprioceptive skills, we can teach you how to read the body language. We will teach you how to analyze visually the structure. We will help, help you to find out through analysis of tissue texture exactly where the fascia restrictions are. You'll be able to feel when they release and you'll know when you've made a correction. And the nice thing is when you follow some very simple contraindications, you will never produce trauma. You want to watch, you want to make sure that you do not treat people that have had a recent fracture, have an inflammatory process that it's ongoing, tumors. Certainly the medical signs should be stable, those type of obvious things. So the worst that can happen with myofascial release is people might get a little sore for a day or two after treatment. You always let them know that. It's kind of like a workout soreness. But what I have found is that people intuitively get instantaneously that this is important to the recovery. Something feels right about this. We were taught that we have a linear body, and we were taught some very logical techniques to take care of that linear, logical body of ours. The problem is we run into another myth here, because as you well know, our body is neither linear nor logical. In fact, we're very illogical at times, aren't we? What we really have when we begin to understand the fascial system is a quantum body, especially when you begin to understand its whole body nature. All those bits and pieces, all those labels that we were taught, all those nice, neat little compartments, the origin and insertion of muscles are certainly there. But when you understand the fascial system, fascial restrictions pay absolutely no attention to the origin and insertion of muscles. They run through the muscles, they twist, they turn, they go in spirals. It's totally unpredictable. And the only way to be able to assess where a fascial restriction will be will be through proper visual analysis and analysis of tissue texture. Now the fascia is essentially a three-dimensional web that interpenetrates every structure of the body. It surrounds every muscle of our body. It surrounds every fascicle, every fiber, every microfiber down to the cellular level. Fascia is exactly the environment of every cell of your body. So that there's no cell of their body that can escape the influence of the fascial system. In fact, recent research has just come out stating that within every cell of our body lies a cytoskeleton, which is made of fascia, which is absolutely essential for the proper shape of the cell, which turns out to be absolutely essential for the proper functioning of every cell of our body. And then in between each cell, as we've mentioned, lies the spiderweb effect that is our body's shock absorber. It protects us. It supports us. It carries nutrients throughout the gelatinous substance. You could look at the fascial system as sort of like this gauze here, full of space for the nerves, blood vessels, and fluid of our body to pass. Under ideal conditions, the fascial system should be flexible. It should give. The problem is that when we get fascial restrictions, it'll tend to shorten and twist. Just imagine what will happen to the nerves, the blood vessels that pass through these structures then. You're going to get entrapment-like syndromes. You'll begin to crush blood vessels, creating ischemic-like conditions. And imagine that my fist are the osseous structures of the body to which the fascial system attaches. So as the fascial system tightens and twists, it begins to pull the osseous structures too close together, compressing the structures that this that lie in between, putting abnormal pressure on adjacent nerves and blood vessels. And this kind of pressure can eventually produce the very symptoms that we've been trying to eliminate with our patients. It's important to recognize also the power of this tissue. Fascia can create tensile strengths of up to approximately 2,000 pounds per square inch. That is enormous pressure. 
That is the equivalent of the pressure of the strength of a radial tire. So the good news is that you will never overstretch the fascial system. You'll be merely releasing that which should not be there. If you want to look at the body as a whole body system, when we take a fascia perspective, which it is, the thing that we like to say to people is, find the pain, look elsewhere for the cause. Rarely will the symptoms be anywhere close to the true cause of the problem. We have been coming enamored to an effect what we have called symptoms. Symptoms is a Greek word for sign or signal, signaling imbalance or infection within the body. It is just not enough to simply treat symptoms. Obviously, that's very important, but we want to have a cause and effect relationship. So when we begin to include myofascial release into your treatment regimes, we truly have the total cause and effect relationship. Therefore, every fascia restriction, let's say, in the thigh could reach up throughout all of these nice little neat compartments that we were taught and ultimately produce an effect in the neck that we call a symptom, neck pain, neck tightness, etc. A restriction, say, in the chest could reach down into the leg and create a problem due to the lack of balance or alignment that it would cause and a problem within the knee itself. So we have to start to open our focus now. We've actually become very myopic. And we need to open our focus. We need to understand the fascial system and include it in our evaluatory and treatment regimes. So here I am in 1995 suggesting to you that we have an erroneous view of the body and how it functions. And what I'd like to suggest to you is the word called tensegrity. This is a word coined by the architectural genius Buckminster Fuller. And basically what is being said here is that we are a myofascial space truss. This is a tensegrity model. If you would look at these blue struts as your bones, and this as the elastic and muscular component of the myofascial system. So that you can see that this adds both, allows for both compression and tension throughout our system. It might help you to better understand that when we do a myofascial procedure, as we put pressure into the system, the entire system will respond throughout. So wherever restriction might lie, over time will receive our sustained pressure and that sustained pressure over time will allow for a release, an elongation of the tissue, lessening the amount of pressure on nerves, blood vessels, and allowing the osseous structures to return into a proper aligned state. <clears throat> I'd like to be very clear in that medicine modalities, exercise and flexibility programs, massage, manipulation, joint mobilization procedures, the various movement awareness techniques, affect the elastic component, the muscular component of the myofascial complex. Only myofascial release affects its totality. The elastic component, the muscular component, the cross-links that tend to develop within the collagenous aspect, and probably most important of all, its ground substance, which I think tends to solidify from trauma and inflammatory processes. Most people that have yet to experience myofascial release tend to think that our whole focus is the fascial system. And that's not the case at all. We use the fascial system as a handle or lever because as we structurally release the fascial system, and those restrictions that lie within, we are also providing a very positive and profound effect upon the spindle cell of its muscular component, the Golgi tendon organs, the neural system, the vascular system, the respiratory system, the entirety. Because it's far more accurate to say instead of saying really that the fascial system surrounds everything, it's far more accurate to say everything lies within the fascial system. We are essentially this gelatinous sea of fascia. So we need to begin to step back and take another look at our bodies and how they function. Now I'd like to use the spine to go over some of the concepts that we'll be going through both for the evaluation and treatment. I think one of the other myths that we were taught is that we have closed systems, so that you could just treat the bones, you could just treat the muscles, you could just treat the nerves, etc. What we really have in vivo is a myofascial osseous neural complex. They cannot be separated out in vivo, and the connection between all of that is the connective tissues, the fascial system. So in essence, what we have forgot is the very environment of every structure of our being. We can no longer afford to do that because this environment is very important to our well-being and our function. Here we have the typical anatomical model. Of course, there's no fascial system on here. 
Now, I'd like to bring you through a factual perspective of what we look for when we evaluate people. What we see with the vast majority of patients, probably the vast majority of you sitting there in the audience today, somewhere around 90% of the individuals you will see will have a torsion of the pelvis. I perceive the pelvis as the foundation of the human structure, and of course the legs, the feet under it as their supporting structures. So the problem is, for various reasons, the pelvis has tipped forward in space, usually with a twist, if you would look at my hands as the ilia. So we were taught rather myopic diagnoses, in other words, as if there was such a thing as, say, a right sacroiliac lesion, or there was such a thing as, say, an L4, L5 problem, or maybe there was a C4, C5 lesion. The problem is that when we start to look at this from a whole body perspective, you'll see that that is fallacious. For if the sacrum has shifted in space and the ilia have shifted in space, it's going to set up a whole chain of events. And let me just go through a scenario of possibilities for you. Let's say, for example's sake, that the right ilia has shifted forward in space anteriorly. And imagine my hand is the ilia. As the ilia shifts forward anteriorly in space, this acetabulum will be dropped down, functionally lengthening the leg on that side. Then due to the abnormal pull of the musculature and fascia, you will tend to get an internal rotation of that particular femur sending abnormal forces down through that hip, knee, ankle, and foot with each step that you take. Now we're a bilateral being, so what will tend to happen is the left ilia will tend to posteriorly rotate. And as the left ilia posteriorly rotates, this will draw this acetabulum up, functionally shortening the leg on this side. And then due to the abnormal pull of the musculature and fascia, we will tend to get an external rotation of that particular femur sending abnormal forces down to that hip, knee, ankle, and foot. Next, we have to pay attention to the pubic synthesis, and this is very important. For as the ilia shifts, whether it be a rotation, up slips, down slips, etc., the pubic synthesis is going to shear. This is very important to us. For all of the powerful muscles of the lower extremity that come up and attach into this region then, as this shears, no longer has a firm foundation from which to pull against. This then begins to create fatigue, pain, energy loss, spasm, symptoms. The fascial system then is torqued around the pelvic floor through which many important structures pass. Now the fascial system doesn't end here, but the fascial system surrounds every structure within your pelvic bowl. The organs, the nerves, the blood vessels, the ducts creating a twisted, crushing environment of these very delicate, important structures. So the goal of myofascial release is to remove this mechanical pressure from these vital structures, and once the structure has not been fully destroyed, it now has the potential to function more comfortably and efficiently again, and that's what myofascial release is all about. When we have tightness in this region, these tightnesses anteriorly can create so many of our posterior symptoms, back pain, sacroiliac problems, menstrual problems, pelvic pain. Now we have a long and a short leg. So every step we take is the equivalent of stepping off a curb. You know, they have done studies where each heel strike is the equivalent of a car hitting a brick wall at 55 miles per hour. That's a lot of force. This forces the system to compensate with each step. Over time, then, what's going to happen because of these imbalances? is the sacral base, the foundation of the spine, will shift in space. They will then get a pull due to the imbalances of the iliolumbar ligaments. They come from the spinous processes of L3, 4, and 5. And like guy wires, they come over and attach to the ilia. So now imagine this torque creating an abnormal pull on the ligamentous and myofascial structures. And what that's creating for us now is a rotoscoliosis of the lumbar spine beginning to bulge out the interdiscal material, putting pressure on adjacent nerves and blood vessels, localized symptoms, and or radicular problems. What happens then is that side bending rotation of the lumbar spine begins to create a hard osseous wedging effect bulging out that soft interdiscal material. Now over time, as we continue to move through space in the gravitational field with these imbalances in our system, they seem to slowly spread insidiously, like a ticking time bomb, and they're not being picked up with all the standard testing. And over time then, our spine 
is slowly going into a rotoscoliosis, creating havoc throughout all of these structures, producing symptoms in very individualistic ways. And you can begin to see it's not enough just to take care of the joint that's becoming irritated or this localized muscle that's in spasm. As the sacral base shifts, we get this rotoscoliosis, and over time, the atlas axis complex will shift in space. And as you know, your atlas axis complex is responsible for the position of your head and the only bilateral joint of your body, the TMJ mechanism. So as you shift in space now, your jaw is being compressed, the stract on the other side, the meniscus is being, being forced anterior, the pterygoids are going into spasm, we're starting to click, we're starting to hurt, symptoms, everybody's focused here. Or we're hurting here and everybody's treating here. But what about all of these supporting structures that have everything to do with the whole functioning of the whole human unit? <clears throat> So we need to step back and take a whole other look at the situation because the fascial system is there, it's important, and it can no longer be ignored. Now what we're going to be doing now is going through evaluation of the fascial system, with, which we do both standing and lying down. And we want to start to step back after you've done your regional evaluations, take a look at the whole picture here now. What I'd like you all to do is sort of soften your focus Use your peripheral vision and imagine in your mind's eye that a line is going down to the center of her body. And I want you simply to be asking yourselves, where is she pulled off center? We're thinking in terms of tightness that will pull the person off their center of gravity. We go down to her feet for a moment slowly. You'll always notice the person's feet, and you want to see are they planted into the ground equally. And take notice of her right foot. Notice how it's rolling in, it's pronating. As we come up slowly, you will see that the right knee is pulled back into Gina Recurvatum. Her pelvis is tipping forward anteriorly. You can notice that her right shoulder is down and forward compared to the left. And I want you to take notice now of the tension in the left upper extremity. Think in terms of fascia, going past the origin insertion of muscles. That tightness, as you can see, is not only pulling that shoulder up and in, but look at the effect it has on her head. Her head is being pulled to the left, and she is rotating to the left. OK, now if you could turn to the side and face that way, please. A little bit more, that's good right there. Now, as you can notice, her knees are being pulled back in a genery curvatum. Her pelvis is thrust forward in space, which will spill the abdominal pelvic contents forward, and many people produce an excessive lumbar lordosis. Her right shoulder is a little bit too far forward, and you see that her head is significantly forward. Now, when I was young and trained as a therapist, I was trained then to give people back extension exercises. But when we need to now start to look more three-dimensionally and understand that it could be the anterior fascia that is tightening down, pulling the head forward. So it's like we've been walking around with a bucket of bolts around our neck, and we've been giving them strengthening exercises to handle the bucket of bolts. To me, it makes far more sense to unload the system, free it up, allow the person's head to come back, and then add in these strengthening exercises. This way, we've taken the strain out of the system, we've improved alignment, and now exercises work that much more proficiently. Now, can we see from the rear, please? Now, you can see again from the rear how her pelvis is thrust forward. The curve of her waist is different on the left than the right. Her upper quarter seems to be moving to the right a bit. And there seems to be an awful lot of tension throughout the trapezius and levator scapular regions. OK, thank you very much. You know, let's take a shot of her whole body. And again, I ask you to quiet yourselves down. Slow your breathing a bit so you can relax. Don't try not to think of anything now, just with a blank mind. Just visually absorb three-dimensionally. Get an imprint of where is she three-dimensionally in space. And you can see that her knees are being thrust back into Gina Recurvatum. There's more space between the left arm and the pelvis. The pelvis has shifted to the right a bit. Her right shoulder is low and forward. 
Her left is up. Her clavicle is angulated up on the left. And again, if you will take notice of the tension throughout the left upper extremity, see how that angles up through the clavicular area. It's actually creating a pull on her mouth on the left. And can you see the notice the difference in her eyes? If we can maybe get a closer shot of her face now. So the financial system reaches up internally and attaches interiorly to the inside of all your facial bones, cranial bones, TMJ. And so the imbalances down, further down in your body can actually produce an effect all the way up into the cranial mandibular mechanism. Now if we could pull back again, I'd like to check the anterior superior iliac spine. And what we're going to be looking for now, both standing and eventually lying down, is we're going to find the notch at the anterior superior iliac spine. We're going to place our thumbs in there and we're going to look for levelness. As we do this, you can see that she is lower on the right than the left. So if my hands were her ilia, she would be shifted that way. Similar to what we mentioned earlier when we were mentioning the, can we turn you around now? The skeleton. We check the posterior superior iliac spine, and we find that the PSIS is high on the right. So we have a rotation of her ilia this way. Now, if you look at her spine, you can see that there's a pull right here. Notice how her scapulas are flared. She's very deep here. And if we turn her this way, 